Okay, so we start with the book review. Yeah. A Telltale Blade. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So today, uh, I'll be sharing my uh, insights and experience uh, after reading. So I, I gained after reading this book, uh, The Telltale Brain, a neuroscientist quest for what makes us human by Dr. V. S. Ramachandran. So actually, this is one of the really interesting books I uh, read which is in the field of neuroscience, which talks about interesting phenomena in human brain. And his studies uh, based on some uh, interesting patient groups. So uh, before going into detail, let, uh, let me just uh, give you a brief uh, uh, introduction about the human brain and a few interesting facts as well. So as we may all know, the basic element in the human brain is uh, called neuron. So, if we like, dissect the brain and we see uh, we have close to 100 billion neurons and each neuron makes at least 1,000 to 10,000 connections. So if we take the combinations and the permutations, we can see that 100 trillion connections in total, uh, uh, neuron connections in total in our brain. So, and I want to uh, emphasize the uh, different parts of uh, our brain. So you can see that uh, the frontal lobe, which is primarily responsible for thinking, planning, uh, and uh, organizing, and motor cortex, uh, which is responsible for your movement. When I want to uh, like move my hand, then I get the signals from the motor cortex. And likewise, uh, there's uh, the parietal lobe, which is for the perception. And we have different parts of the brain, which are responsible for different actions. Uh, so, in this review, uh, there are lots of things, uh, lots of interesting things uh, in this book. I chose three interesting phenomena and I wanted to, uh, since we all are in the uh, era of uh, artificial intelligence and we get insights from how uh, does the human brain uh, function, so I wanted to link these uh, interesting phenomena with the adaptation, the possible adaptations I think in the artificial uh, intelligence. The first phenomena is uh, phantom limb. In the phantom limb, uh, what is uh, the special here is when, uh, when an arm or leg is amputated, a patient uh, gets the sensation that the amputated arm or leg is still there. So, because uh, it is not just a delusion, it, it is a perception patient gets. So Dr. Ramachandran's uh, work on the phantom limb is in the learned paralysis. Uh, what happened in the learned paralysis is uh, before amputating a limb, uh, there can be a nerve damage uh, from a nerve that is going from your motor cortex to say a hand. There's a, there's a neuron uh, breakdown because of an accident. And so now patient can't even though the motor cortex sends the signals to the hand, patient sees that he can't move his hand. So he learned a paralysis in the brain. Okay, even though I have my hand, I can't move it. So it, it, is, it is called as the learned paralysis. But when that the arm is amputated, a patient uh, say they experience a, a special pain, which is called uh, called uh, pain due to the phantom limb because of this learned paralysis. And so now uh, the arm is amputated, He's, he or she sees the phantom limb, but he can't move. But there's the already learned part of his, in the mortal cortex, say that there's a paralysis. So Dr. Ramchandran's work on this area is uh, to how to unlearn this. Um, he uses this uh, interesting experiment called the mirror box experiment. So you can see that when you enter your both your the, the phantom arm and the, uh, so the arm intact, so uh, a patient uh, sees that when he moves the uh, arm which is intact, he sees that his phantom is moving. So, but even you might think that, but this is a delusion. He he's not uh, like. Uh, he can clearly distinguish this is not the reality. Uh, so, after you, I, you would think that you can distinguish. Yeah, yeah. So, 
This talks about an interesting uh, experiment. So Dr. Ramchandran asked the patient to take this mirror box to home, experience it with two, three weeks. Then he realized, okay, this is a delusion. I don't have my arm anymore. So he unlearns the part that is already learned uh, in the mod cortex. Uh, so uh, now the important, uh, the interesting idea, uh, like I had to ask, okay, the brain's ability to learn something okay, and forget something and relearn a new reality. So I wanted to see how this learn, unlearn, relearn uh, concept is being played in the uh, artificial intelligence. So if you take uh, long short term memory for an example, so we use, uh, it has uh, a different uh, gating mechanisms. It has a forget gate to forget. So for example, I, I'll walk you through a, uh, an example in predicting the next word of a text. In the first uh, sentence, you can see that the clouds are in the sky. So if the sky is the word that we want the algorithm to predict, you can see that since it talks about cloud, predicting sky can be uh, like uh, predicting sky is uh, possible because it talks about the context. The context which it talks about is something uh, <coughs> related to clouds. But if you go to the second example, the second sentence, I grew up in France, I speak fluent French. If the French is the word that we want the LSTM to predict, it doesn't have to do anything with the insights it learned from the first sentence, the clouds are in the sky. So in this uh, scenario, uh, the forget gate comes into play. It forgets, okay, I don't want to uh, have the insights I learned from the first sentence, and temporarily it forgets. So you can see that uh, in the, the adaptation of the learn, unlearn, relearn in the human brain is being played in the uh, LSTM. So the next uh, example I uh, came across was uh, the price prediction. Uh, uh, one second. Very interesting. So where, where did you, where did you, where did you uh, see this discussion in the LSTM of uh, forget k, 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 you know, is this your deduction that this forget yeah. gate is potentially unlearned mechanism? Yes. Yeah. Then I, I also found few papers because it is like uh, true that uh, this is an adaptation, this is a special version of the recurrent neural networks. Mm -hmm. In the recurrent neural networks, we have cross connections. Mm -hmm. I'll be talking about cross connections in the second part mm -hmm. uh, of the presentation. Mm -hmm. So in LSTM, what people wanted to investigate was, okay, we learn some realities uh, when we have data, mm -hmm. but sometimes with the new information mm -hmm. at hand, we don't want the past predictions dominate our, dominate the uh, outcome that in the present of new information so that in, in these cases we want to like gain the short term memory so in the price prediction you see that uh, people when uh, buying stock when buying stocks we usually look at yesterday's price and week before's price so we we, we investigate the trend uh, if you take uh, apple as an example today apple decides to uh, release a new iphone now you see, because of this new information, I don't want to. Uh, I would. I don't want to invest in Apple, not just because of the previous. Say it had a downward trend in the last week, but I see people are interested in talk. Uh, interested in this uh, iPhone. I want to uh, make use of this new information, and uh, try to uh, invest in Apple. So this scenario can be captured in this sequence prediction task uh, with the LSTM. Because short term information is also uh, preferred over the long term uh, memory. And but, uh, okay. But you'll have to kind of construct it to uh, kind of dampen the uh, yes, thing uh, or uh, exam, you know, less than one or more than one depending upon dampen or enhance. Right? Yeah. Um, and you can see lots of papers in like uh, uh, time series forecasting. So the stock market prediction is one of the types that uh, it can be 
reduced to a time series forecasting problem. People right. use LSTM for these but, things. Uh, yeah, but you know, this, if you, the, the whole thing is that if you simply take the market data, stock prices by yeah. some time, that simplistic model would not work very well, and then you need to bring in the perturbation, every news yeah. item, yeah. and then you want to say, particularly then you give the weather, uh, yeah. you know, whether it is a positive or negative yes. uh, impetus, and you have to somehow even come up with the weight. Yeah. So yeah. introducing a new product is one thing, and an analyst um, uh, call uh, of upgrading or downgrading is another thing. Yeah. So and uh, they, they both have very different uh, possible you know, impact or level of impact. So in my understanding, what LSTM uh, works well, uh, the, the, the reason why LSTM works well is you can't get a really good accurate prediction after, like, just after, say, if Apple released the iPhone today, tomorrow's prediction might be wrong. But the day after can also be with the uh, with thrown, but a lesser margin. But for the next week, it learns the new reality and it tries to adapt to it and uh, predict the coding. So, moving on to the second uh, phenomenon, uh, it's it's a, a neurological disorder called synesthesia, and uh, synesthesia is actually a condition in which uh, a person experiences uh, crossed uh, responses to a stimuli. For example, uh, people, the patients uh, with uh, you know, uh, synesthesia will uh, get the sensation of uh, seeing the red color when uh, they see number one. Number one. And same as uh, if they, when they see the notes, music note B flat and the C sharp, they can also uh, relate it to colors. So, uh, Dr. Ramchandran uh, uh, points out a few interesting facts here. This is actually caused by a gene, and because of that, it is uh, inherited. And he says that it is eight times more common in artists, uh, poets, and novelists. So, uh, actually, uh, this is because of cross connection. We, so, I myself told that it's a neurological, neurological disorder. But in the human brain, there are lots of cross connections across the parts I showed in the first uh, first image of the brain's uh, cross sections. So the metaphorical thinking is actually uh, we, we are able to do meta metaphorical thinking due to the ability due to this very ability of the cross connection. So we can now, now think about novel creative ideas by linking like unrelated concepts. So uh, the other, uh, one of the examples uh, uh, expressed in this book was this uh, two shapes. Uh, if, I, if I ask you, which one do you pick is the kiki, and which one is the booba? <laughs> Any guesses? First one is kiki. Okay. Okay. You, you guys are normal. Huh? Okay. You guys are normal. Normal human beings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what the new normal human being would be, yeah. because uh, Dr. Ramchandran conducted the experiment. I found the paper as well with uh, hundred of people who have not heard about these two uh, Kiki and Booba uh, terms. And when they showed, when he showed these uh, uh, two shapes, uh, they can actually, like you guys did, they can pick which one is the Kiki, which one is the Booba. So he explains the uh, neuroscience aspect of it because when I say kiki, and it's, there's a sound associated with it. So you there's are, a certain sharpness there. Yeah, and sharpness. So you are trying to, you get the visual feedback from your eyes. Uh, there are sharp edges in the kiki uh, shape, and there are round edges in the booba. Your brain tries to map the connection with your auditory cortex, the learned uh, aspects from the auditory cortex and linking it with the visual cortex. So that's why you get the ability to uh, uh, differentiate uh, a phenomenon like this. Uh, so isn't it uh, what uh, makes uh, humans creative? Because some of you might have not uh, heard these two words, 
because I didn't. I didn't. Either. Yeah. No. And we were still able to uh, deduct that okay, this this could be a kiki. No, but for all that matters, uh, this may not be kiki or bubai at all. Yeah. Right. I mean, this may be just something you come up with. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, you know, these shapes have no name. These are very irregular shapes. There's probably yeah. no, no name given to them anyway. Yeah. But right? if I if someone tells about a yeah. name. They if you want to give a name, what would be appropriate label for yes, exactly. this, you know, shapes, you probably would pick this uh, as a normal one. Yeah. Right? So, and, uh, so I wanted to... But, but did artists come up differently? You know, no, I forgot no. now. It's been a long time since... Yeah, I no, he, what he uh, says was, in, uh, he observes this uh, synesthesia issue in eight times uh, more in with the artist and novelist because... Mm. because uh, cross-linking. Yeah, cross-linking. Mm. And, uh, so meaning uh, 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 that, that the artists and uh, creative thinkers are a lot more uh, cross, the, cross connections. Uh, cross connections meaning uh, uh, going along with these um, uh, similarities or going against the similarities. So to, to some extent, this kiki and that thing is more like people are trying to go with some form of similarity. Yeah, uh, there's a different kind of there's a roundedness with booba. Mm. And uh, you know, there's this, you know, so people who may pick that booba is there some sort of roundedness in the sound and uh, uh, you know, use of um, what you call um, you know, O and A yes. thing uh, that, that has mm. some form of very, very weak analogy. Yeah. Is that more in artisanal or, uh, I, or it is less? I, I think that, ra I mean, rather than like. Uh, Checking for the similarities and all, artists and uh, creative thinkers have more more kind of linking ability than normal people does. I think that's it, what it's he not wanted about, to make the It's thing. not about checking for the similarity. It's about linking the concepts. Okay, so. just about able to link. Uh, yes. I think so. Okay, and the the question though is, is it that the ability of linking? Um, based on a strong cues or is it ability of linking based on a very diverse weak cues uh, what i mean to say is that let's say a scientist mm -hmm. who is fact driven mm -hmm. would um, consider not making uh, linking when things are not exactly the same or perfectly the same or um, when there is not a strong connection uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know while uh, i mean while some other type of people, let's guess, artists, for example, mm -hmm. uh, they may be um, willing to take more leap of faith, more weak cues, more analogies of diverse forms, uh, you know, in, in making their thing. And they, they're willing to take a similarity uh, where the scientist or fact-based person may not. Right? Yeah, yeah, I get it. And, I mean, this, is, this is a guesswork, uh -huh, but this uh -huh. is a hypothesis, right? And if that is the case, then yeah, I mean, that, that, that looks like a reasonable. But what you are saying here is though, just the focus on ability to link. And no, I think that the conditions in which you link versus just the ability to link, there are two different concepts here. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, you think that the emphasis should be on just the fact that you can link or not. While I'm wondering whether it is also the fact that under what conditions do you link or not? Yeah. Sorry. I think that this this particular example is telling that every human being has that linkage, but uh, seeing that a number is arbitrarily linked with a color, that is uh, more in uh, creative thinking as in novelist and poets. I think that is a very arbitrary thing mm. in a perspective of. But then I would argue that creative people are willing to take more um, chances. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, true. That, that's true. Totally separate from this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. The metaphorical thinking, hmm. if it's an hour, so it so for example, so what it may mean is that like when you have to write a fiction and you have to make imagination, uh, you can go farther away from facts to do so, and that is easier for such novelist writing fiction, it would be harder for a scientist that says, I want to be closer to the fact, right? Now, to, to me though, uh, sorry, Vinod, you want to say something? Uh, scientists are used to 
thinking systematically. Uh, whereas artists, uh, they just think randomly and make more connections between the concepts, right? Yeah, the, okay. I think the emphasis is a different, but okay, fine. So, so you know, these two, to me, um, let me let me discuss a potential potential computational artifact, or uh, you know, that is somewhat related to this. So we were doing research in uh, semantic association, yeah. right? How two things are related, right? And um, let's say that. Um, um, relationship, two things being related, two people being related, for example, or people and an organization being related, um, could be based on something very concrete that is available to you as a fact, versus um, an investigator, detective, taking a leap of faith, saying, I saw this person at this place at the same time and that gives me stronger, even though that person was not seen acting in that specific context, you would uh, you know, uh, have, be more suspicious. So you may look for um, uh, form, of, form of connections that may you, you may try to um, uh, consider a lot more connections than what is there in actual, you know, let's say, uh, uh, data, right? And the point here is, the point here is, hypothesis, that everything we do in computer science is really requiring um, a concrete data to make the connections. So I'll be and then, about okay. This. And then, um, you know, uh, analogy would be that uh, you have exact term match. Mm -hmm. And then you go with um, uh, term match where you have um, uh, lexical variations. And you are able to deal with the dis differences, lexical variations, yet potentially they mean the same thing. Then you are going, willing to take an external data which maps those terms. That's not here, but in knowledge base, they are synonyms. In knowledge base, they are um, acronyms. In knowledge base, they are, uh, or there's a uh, algorithm that uh, allows you to compute that the two things are same. Um, in uh, old work, I'm talking about 1980s, um, uh, we used to work on what was, what was called as a semantic attribute uh, or dynamic attribute. What it means is that you have two objects they don't have exactly, literally the same representation in computational form, meaning syntactically they are not the same. But they are related via some things, via a formula, a transformation function, a dictionary or table lookup, asking an expert in the field, looking up a knowledge base. You see, there are various ways, intermediate ways, where the two things are connected. Right? They're not exactly committed. So, so what, 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 what I'm trying to say here is, and what we do routine, routinely, right? So in, 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 in our Fido's work, we found that buprenorphine occurred in text. Um, for every one occurrence of buprenorphine, there were 29 occurrences that were slangs and other things, bup and bup and so on and so forth, right? So anybody who did pure syntax-based matching would fail. Lexical even variations would fail. Rule-based mapping would fail, right? Uh, and so, um, come up, coming up with that approximate thing is very important. So, just to give you a background, you know, further background, at least particularly to the PhD students, this is a for aspect that had come up in my formulation of semantic proximity. 1992, so far, year so near, so far schematically yet so near semantically. And then that another follow-on paper in the Journal in 1996, which is, I think, very highly cited, maybe 800 plus citations, uh, that deal with this issue. Right? So approximate matching or semantic matching is an old thing. And to what level you can add uh, these variations and approximates is very good. Looking forward to our own future research, right? 
to the extent that we uh, that the rest of the world follows more of a pure database concrete match based things versus we are able to add other layers and mappings based on different uh, techniques i was telling you right uh, table lookup or mathematical formula or whatever or lexical matches and uh, um, uh, transformation functions but we may also eventually explore mapping based on abstractions so uh, the example here would be that you're supposed to look for the word and there is a, so basically there's something you know lexical thing there right and a shape and i may come i may try to connect them through sound that is the you know sounds like is my transformation function think about it right so if you can imagine you know uh, that there is in some cases our computations can bring in this other form of things and see what happens it could be very interesting and you know so keep keep it that in mind see if you can come up with thing where um the transformation functions are not very concrete or mathematical but are allow required to go in other plane so your feeling let's say we are talking about um you like you just look at one person and your brain immediately decides in matter of i think there's some number there but in you know very short amount of time that you like that person or not and what could it be it could be thousand different things it could be look it could be behavioral pattern right it could be how that person stands it could be how that person approach suppose you are a woman and a, and a man approach you in certain way just that thing would immediately decide for you you like this guy or you don't like this guy right and and that will remain for you long time before the guy can hopefully work towards saying well that that's only one aspect if i'm really a good guy right so so you could, but what i'm saying here is that there's so many other things that are very soft not hard right that are uh, that lead for humans to decide i can i can say you like or not like let's say like is a form of relationship a broad form of relationship right and now i say how do i compute likeness between two humans and through and, and i'm studying the inter interaction let's say my job is to study the interaction and this guy is probably you know would be very interested in those things how would i uh, you know like uh, what are the ways in uh, uh, you know that that one likes another person or not and how many parameters may come into picture right but it's quite possible for such things there is no simple hard fact based thing and there's so many other soft things you like because you suddenly feel oh so it's like you know i remember when i came to us what 37 years ago 36 plus years ago there were pretty few number you know the number of indians were very few and so no i don't talk about just me but i would observe other indians also if they uh, find in a bus or public transportation or an airport somebody else who just looks like you you try to a try you know have a conversation strike up a conversation and 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 the interesting thing is now at what level because when you are seeing when you seeing somebody you, you know it's not necessary that you are even limited to indian per se as so, you know if i see somebody like we know the like uh, uh, you know dipesh to me i would i would i would react the same way because they just look the same and so it's that thing that you are you know uh, re uh, re reflecting to right and now the things are different now there's so many other you know now for example my child who still because her parents are both kind of you know come from indian ancestry they still look completely indian right on on without before they speak um and so but but in them he will be very different right that because their cultural context is very different and they would psych up the communication uh with uh, you know somebody looking much different than them um uh, let's say a cognition far more easily than what probably i did 35 years ago right 
so i'm i'm, I'm talking about the aspect of soft so you know soft aspects of relationship finding to the extent that relations are so fundamental to what we study keep this in mind we will come back to you some day when we discuss venner bush and other things go on. yeah yeah i just have a question hmm. you mentioned anything about this this sort of cross connections or uh, whatever we are talking about occurs due to the experience that we get because i was trying to relate it with the example that he was saying so when we see a person mm -hmm. the way he stand the way he dress actually makes an impression within us right in, yeah. i mean to, uh, to us so these might be due to the facts that since the childhood we have been seeing people and we have been i mean we are taught that way like uh, okay this is a kind of a bad dressing this is a kind of a i mean this is a kind of a dressing that not the normal person does or something like that so these cross connections might be due to that or it's like just the natural ability of a brain even uh, let's assume the kid can talk and the kid can uh, assume these sort of connections even the child can do it i mean these cross connections come with an experience like connecting one to I red or some it's no. just the natural ability of the brain i think that's how the brain is evolved so the ability the very ability you you are talking about so first impression mm. of seeing a person is actually you are not consulting uh, one particular area of the brain and asking for feedback it is just a like the system of all the parts of the brain making connections and letting you know okay this is the to give you a green light or red light yeah but if i if i thought that okay uh, if this particular sort of dressing is actually implies me a uh, uh, some sort of what to say if that sort of dressing gives me a feeling that this i mean if i'm thought that that is a very good way of dressing and that is that if a person is dressing that way and he or she is a very good person if i'm thought that way obviously my mind would be thinking that when i see a person like that okay he is he or she is a very good person right so but that is also a sort of connection and this is also a sort of connection yes. i don't know how i mean i'm having a hard time placing those two things this basically comes by experience and this is by the nat i mean you're saying that this is by natural ability of the brain so and so if you like pause and just think uh, what do we mean by experience so we yeah i was basically so uh, say that uh, now uh, today you encounter totally new uh, something so which decides you about a, like uh, which helps decide you about a, a first impression of the person you see next uh, to tomorrow now your brain the brain status in tomorrow has already taken into account the experience you had today so the experience is gained over time from childhood to where you are today you have gained a vast amount of experience and now your brain is actually doing something very interesting to come up with creative things come up with uh, uh, impulsive decisions so i think uh, the experience and the cross connections so they all work together so you can't like have one thing that can explain the brain so i think Excuse But I'm no expert. I think okay, a neuro, okay. neuroscientist. No, I was just asking whether he mentioned yeah. something like that. So I think, I think that you know when when we decide that this sharp shape is key key. Yes. Actually, we just we just based on our experience, which means we just correlate them. Yes. Just correlate the key key with the sharp shape. But what human is very good to do is that we could explain why we do that, mm. right? But at the first moment when you Question, we don't think like that. We just say, "Oh, this is bad." But yeah. then only we give an explanation to them. Say that, "Oh, because whenever we experience sharp things, the mm -hmm. sound is sharp, so we get the kick." So I think experience is what correlation is. Yeah. Yeah. Even I will. I would like to back up his point on the two different system of the brain. So many uh, research scientists have came out this with this system where the brain is composed by system one and system two. Where the system one is more of uh, intuitive thinking and system two is more of a rational thinking. So at the first moment, we will come up with we we will go for intuitive thinking first. Then mm. only we transfer that 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 feel to the rational thinking part to back up why we say 
Kiki is the one that is sharp. So it's like a two system. How do you explain that? Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so I have a question. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So over on your this topic of Kiki versus Buba, is it like the sound we have in our mind that has this impression of sharp edges versus round shapes? Or is it actually the way these words are spelled out, you know, K I K I? Some you know, as you can see some there's some sharp edges. So here, the words are so in this out. book uh, Buba he's has some round talking shapes about the uh, words are sound. So is it like visual representation of these words or is it like the sound is they make in our minds. Let's say, for instance, I don't, I cannot read this word. Is what this word mean? But I can uh, somehow see simply the letters. So B or U, they kind of have some round shapes. So is it like a visual representation? That's so, so, is? so the point here is, though, I think you. There is not going to be necessarily a. So, how? W what features lend? Uh, or give you the similarity. At the end of the day, you are trying to look for similarity, right? What you are now, what you, it is reasonable, I think, to um, believe that there are many things that can contribute to similarity, and that there is no one necessary thing, and that different people maybe may do it differently. So there are people who. Uh, mm, are artistic. There are people who are not artistic. There are people who uh, want. They are, they are intuitive. There are people who are uh, not intuitive, but they have some other. You know, they are the other side of the intuitive. So, the psychological profile, for example, right? There are. Th you know, uh, you can see that. Uh, I forget uh, the things, but there are the well-known aspects of psycho for, uh, prof psychological profiles, and uh, you, you are either this way or that way, and you are in the middle. Point here is, it could be any one of them, and. It could be different in different people. That is not. I don't see that. You know whether it is based on the you know the the use of letters and words that is uh, more important, or is it because of the sound that you are ma these words map to and the uh, you know there is a common mapping in terms of uh, a concept. We have in our brain there is a concept of roundness and sharpness. And whether the roundness and sharpness is derived because of your, um, you know, uh, how you how you pronounce something, and the sound associate you associate with word, sound you associate it with the shape, or it is other aspect, not the sound, other aspect that takes you loud roundness as the intermediary to do the mapping to show the similarity. There is a similarity. Hypothesis, let's say simplistic hypothesis, one hypothesis is that the similarity is based on the broad concept of roundness and sharp, sharpness uh, that our brains have. And that either we are using the sound function or you are using some other function to do the mapping of artifact A to the concept of soundness, artifact B to the concept of soundness, uh, roundness or some other form, right? So those are the variations that we have. The important thing to keep in mind, and so, so uh, most likely the answer is that it doesn't have to be the same in every word. Some people are, let's say, very good with hands. Other people are not. Some people are very good with language. Other people are not. But they are, other people are good with math. Right? And yet, it's possible that such diverse people may still find the analogy here, but coming through different functions, different mapping functions. <coughs> Right? And I just used the um, uh, uh, concepts available to me of roundness and sharpness as the way to you know, kind of do the mapping. Who knows? Maybe it's in somebody else's mind. Uh, if, if I did not say this ever, and I asked each of you to come with the saying, said, what was the common abstraction by which uh, this mapping occurred? People might have come with a different one. And right now, you all may be biased and it may be hard to come up with a different one just because you heard this. Yes. Does, can anybody come, come with any other abstraction? Uh, let's say my, I feel, let's say I theorize that abstraction by which you are uh, achieving this mapping is the roundness and uh, sharpness that all of us have. Now, does anybody want to, can anyone else come with other abstractions? I can say that. 
um, along the same line, basically. So, all the sharp objects that we know. No, no, you use the word sharp. That means you are not doing no, the same. No, no, no. I'm saying so that we know in the real world, basically, knife. The word is sharp. Again, sword, scissors. All those words are sharp. So when I hear the word kiki, basically, again, we somehow associate it with sharp. But when we consider round objects, again, bubble, ball. So all those has this B and some googie, gooey sounds and we all automatically associate it with round, uh, round edge objects. So if those two images weren't there actually, if someone said Kiki, I would, op I mean, automatically we would associate it with some sharp objects because we mean so far from, from our childhood or since our childhood, we have been associating some sharp sounded objects with sharp, I mean, sharp visually appearing objects. So the sharp sound and the sharp object is what is, uh, making us to come to this sort of conclusion is what I feel. Okay. So, if but I you still use the sh sharpness as the intermediary, though. The, the, yeah, the, the abstraction true. that allows you to go, uh, you know, uh, to to come to to map yeah, is still the uh, sharpness and numbers. I was and and I think you, what you observe is perfectly fine. That's what uh, uh, you know, and I totally align with that. That you know, all those different variations, the words that you have that have sharp sharpness. Important thing is the intermediary is the sharpness or roundness, Co you know, concept, right? That allowed us to go from that to that and that to that. Yeah. Right? Yeah, okay. well, so Are there fundamentally other abstractions you can come up with? So that is likely that Kiki will take you to that one and go out. Ordering, huh? ordering, like Kiki is given first and that diagram is first and Boba. No, but then uh, in the experience I can always uh, change around. Yeah, I mean, then yeah, th that would th That will not be good, yes. And I think for math, it doesn't really matter how you get to the answer, but in something like this, the, what we're analyzing is the deductive reasoning, right? So here you can get to the same answer in two different ways. One was... Wait, I don't know what, what you... What, again, my question is right now just this, that I, do you have an hypothesis that any other thing, anything other than the concept of sharpness and roundness are are the intermediaries that, that allow you to go from this this different form, which is lexical form, to a shape form. Yeah, okay, you know, like can they do a chart, for example, they teach us uh, the Kiki sign is like a star, and other they don't, I, I don't know. I, yeah, in if, our, if example, our language, we didn't have that. So we are, when we are going to draw, actually, we do like that. Mm -hmm. So you exactly, if you color it, exactly become like that. So you so have what called Kiki? <laughs> yeah, uh, so that's yeah. right. We say that that is a star, and if we come compare it so we can say, okay, this is the shape of a star, and that's not shape of a star. If, if, if you consider yeah, but, it as a different okay, abstract. All right, okay. You know, so, so you are saying that it just so happens According that... According to our experience... Okay, so you, 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 you are saying in your experience, in, in, your, in your conceptual uh, of framework, there is a uh, concept of star. Different. Uh, and that, that concept of star allows you to map Kiki to Kiki, uh, you know, that, that word Kiki to this thing. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah, even if we want to. Now, if, if that is exactly, true. Exactly, yeah, we will do like that, for example, and say, okay, this no, is. No, is that Kiki? No, no, no. We say, okay, if we color no, it, for you, example. Yeah, but how do you get from this to Kiki? So if you color it, it's very similar. I know, but how do you. No, no, no. That's no we not. learned this. This is a similar. <laughs> no, is it I Kiki? Think, no, no then, then, it, then, then I don't get your eye. Sorry, then I don't buy your argument. Like people who read comics, they can come up with this. Like, co in comics, they use this kind of... Question is, comics. question is, what is the, what is the abstract? See, what I'm trying to get yeah, to is the following. I, I, okay. I am trying to get to you is the following. That uh, when we try to do relationships, uh, we are trying to see what is the, ba what is the abstraction by which we relate. So if you remember um, uh, when I uh, talked about um, Werner Bush's uh, work, right? Uh, uh, as we may think, and um, in uh, in the, um, uh, that uh, he's talking about trailblazing, right? Did, did you, some of you remember in my class I had talked about trailblazing, right? So uh, when you when I th when I think about a person, right? Um, then I will I'll. I'll Think about that person in context. So somebody thinks about, um, uh, let's say, uh, you know, let's say some, somebody comes about, you know, thinks about me. Well, there may be variety of context: academic, professor, uh, entrepreneur, having done company, right state where he works at, um, the area of interest uh, X Y Z, right? So you would come to this node called 
Amit Shah, but then you will traverse to something else. You will traverse to something else. And you are traversing in each of the each of the traverses in a context. Right? The context being well, education or uh, interest or um, a role or you know all those things, right? What I'm saying here is that so so the traversals always have a context. That's why those traverses are meaningful. They're not arbitrary. If the, I'm not participating in something, for example, because I'm not a cartoonist and nobody probably thinks of me as an artist, you're just not going to find that context associated with me and you, there's nothing to traverse to. Right? But having the context, let's say, academic, educator, researcher, you'll be able to traverse to something. Here, what is happening is so you, you want to traverse to either this or that and say which traversal is more meaningful. That's what you're doing, right? The point here is that the soundness or sharpness is the, that thing. Is the thing, you know, it, it, it gives you the trellis on which you can then, you know, it gives you the um, uh, uh, handle on which you can then make, you know, go from A to B, right? Or you may say type function kind of thing, right? So, Typically, so all, I'm, all I want to notice is in this context, and this is besides perhaps what he wants to discuss right now, is that it, we, we are discussing because he talked about important uh, aspect of relationship. That as we talk about relationship, I am a big fan of labeled relationship, and I'm extreme, and a big fan of typed labeled relationship as opposed to just a relationship which is unlabeled. So. As a computer scientist, uh, we need to think about structures, data structures. How do you going to represent that? Data is representation or noise representation. And then people come up with, let's say, oh, I'm, I have a linked list. I have um, a graph model. And then I would argue that if for many, many problems that I need to solve, unlabeled graph are no good. Right? The, that, so the, uh, the un unlabeled graphs are much easier to get because your expectations of, uh, the effect of what it takes to go from your data to that representation called label graph is very weak, very little. You have to work harder if you have to label the edge. You have to work even harder, you have to have a type of that you know, uh, label. Right? And the question then uh, becomes, where, should you put it that effort up front or you're going to get the results and then try to find, make sense out of it. It's like you, would you think through what would be the best keywords to do Google search and then get good results in the first go or you're going to do just a subset of what you have in mind, get a lot of results, you know, and then go through, you know, three pages before you guys get what you're looking for or reiterate with better a uh, such term. So these choices that we have. Anyway, we, I think we should let you move. I have uh, one question. Hmm. Uh, the cross connection you said. So suppose in this question, if you just generally ask anyone who will say the like, first one is associated with Kiki and second one is Google. But in different contexts, suppose there is a quiz competition going on. In that context, if you ask me this question, first I will think, okay, it looks like first one is Kiki, second one is Google. But why somebody will ask me this question? Though I know, that it is that it sounds like then it sounds to me, to me like okay it sounds so easy why would someone will ask me this kind of question in this kind of context then I would rather go kiki for the second one and move for the first one so though I know this is not I believe but still I am preferring to deviate from the regularity now when you say for the artist like uh, they have the cross connection if, uh, in the result like eight times they prefer second one is the kiki and first one is the google so an artist what you see, there are two phases you will find in any artist or creative piece. First one you will consider as a learning phase and second one you will consider as an exploring, exploring phase. So suppose if I ask you to draw a bottle, you will just try to imitate how it shapes by a person's face. You will try to just imitate how it looks. But when you become an expert in that area, you are an expert artist, then you try to deviate from the regularities. You try to represent in some other way, like you might see some abstract artist who makes abstract painting. So they don't just imitate the exact thing, they try to represent the things from a different way. Those who are artists or creative people, they know these are the regular things. So they try to tell, okay, let's try to deviate from the regularity and see how it works, how it 
whether it works or not, how it will present. So that becomes a habitual thing for artists or creative people, like they will for the uh, regularities or natural thing. So do you think this could be the case, like an artist will choose second one as a Kiki and first one as a Booba? So do you think that is the case or it's a cross connection? I mean, is there any explanation in that? Like they say that this is a cross connection neuron because they are choosing the opposite one. Different one. So, but though they believe that first one could be Booba and second uh, first one is Kiki, second one is Booba, they have that belief, but they're just trying to debate, okay, let's see, maybe this is not the case. Let's see what happens. Like for any of us, we'll choose in kind of different context, we'll choose different kind of action. Like in exam, suppose we have given some uh, multiple such questions or any other table matching, the left side, left column and right column. We do this kind of reduction. Like when you see those options are too simple, we try to think from a different angle. Why would someone give this kind of simple choices? So do you, uh, do you think it could be not cross connection, just like they are trying to think in different ways? So they believe that uh, this is the actual answer. So as I understand, in this experiment, the Professor Ramachandran was uh, looking for an involuntary answer. So you did not have time to analyze, right? But in the exam paper, the multiple choice, you have time to analyze. You are not just getting the, you are not just marking the answer that just uh, coming out of first, it's, it's not the first thought that comes out of your brain. You don't go with that. You just analyze it. I think this is different. In voluntary, you pick, okay, Kiki is the, uh, uh, this one, star-shaped one, not the bubble-shaped one. And uh, so uh, here, when I when I was reading this, I, I was thinking, okay, now the brain has uh, ability to. Uh, so even though brain has different parts, uh, which is specialized in uh, different kind of uh, activities, like visual, images, the auditory cortex for the audio feedbacks, and when performing a task. It is actually communicating with uh, all of these parts, and so if you are going from uh, like getting insights from what how the brain works to artificial intelligence, so I wanted to compare this cross connection with the multimodality. So, if the objective of the multimodality is to gain intelligence by inter, uh, intelligence by integrating and modeling multiple communicative modalities, including linguistic, caustic and the visual messages. This is not limited to these, only these. Uh, we can uh, also get the touch feedbacks, the haptic feedbacks. So uh, if you take autonomous driving as an example, now see, they have lots of sensors. They have uh, cameras to get the visual feedbacks and uh, radar, sen radar sensors, and they have uh, direct connectivity to the weather channels to get the road conditions. So. When we put all these modalities together, we are able to uh, perform the task of autonomous driving because it perceives not just uh, perceives not through only one modality, on uh, many modalities. I think Dr. Shet was push pushing uh, this idea with uh, the perception, with using uh, not only uh, set, not only uh, patient data, environment data. So, like integrating multiple types of data to get the uh, perception. And uh, I also came across another paper. So they were actually trying to uh, reconstruct uh, the synesthesia phenomena using uh, deep neural networks. So actually, uh, what they were trying to do was to, so in the movie, uh, you get, you have the, the images and the sound. So by using two, uh, different uh, deep neural nets. One is trying to uh, identify the, like uh, learn the multimodal, uh, the sequence network is uh, trying to learn the audiovisual sequencing, uh, and one is learning the image attributes uh, through image compression. So they claim that uh, they can identify the, this model can identify the same or similar image from the sound as the, uh, as patients with the synesthesia. So which means, so in the central hidden layer, they were able to uh, bring the sounds, 
it's like associate sounds with the images so by just uh, seeing the uh, how the so what, what the sound is they can uh, predict the image for example if we, if it uh, hears the uh, sound of dog barking uh, it can associate it with the image of a dog and the third phenomena uh, i wanted to talk was the mirror neurons and this is actually a very interesting uh, thing so mirror neurons are actually uh, it is uh, a type of neurons which fires both when we are performing a certain action and by just seeing someone else performing the same action and uh, mirror this mirrors the behavior of the other as though the observer were itself acting so if you look at the image here you see that the action of reaching to grab something uh, illuminates uh, uh, different parts uh, of the brain and when you see the observed reaching you can see not the full amount but a portion of the same area is being illuminated so that means the uh, dr ramchandran makes a claim here uh, in the motor cortex uh, there are at least 20% of the neurons in the motor cortex are uh, mirror neurons that means we can perceive the action which is performed by someone else as if it was uh, like performing performed by us so uh, there are two scenarios uh, discussed here first one is the imitation and imitation is just uh, learning to perform an action by just uh, observing someone else is doing so uh, he dr ramchandran claims that the emergence of mirror neurons help the advancement of uh, the human civilization because uh, when humans started to like see uh, others doing an action and it quickly helped uh, the civilization to uh, bring new inventions and because uh, you in this example you can see that uh, when this guy uh, shows this action to a baby a monkey it it does the same action it imitates the same action uh, the second scenario is the empathy uh, in the area the somato sensory cortex uh, in the brain it, it is responsible for the uh, touch sensations so uh, now see like we uh, perceive the same thing uh, and when we when we see someone somebody else is doing an action if we perceive the same thing if it happen uh, when we see someone else being touched by another person that would be a chaos right so i'm sorry that would be a chaos if i get the same same sensation what well, you do probably see right? someone else being touched no uh, he 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 means you you, you, you need to control some of it to some yeah. level right but so when you are using a when when you are seeing a movie with fighting i mean you feel you get into this I'm, thing I'm with some you know I'm romance you do have yeah i'm coming here because the brain consults the touch and pain uh, receptors in the skin since there's no feedback it just ignores but there's a important uh, deduction here instead of just uh, perceiving that the same touch sensation mm. humans uh, learn to empathize mm. the action mm. So the mirror neurons are primarily responsible for, uh, yeah. for helping us to put ourselves in other shoes. So I was thinking that there are two things happening. I'm guessing. What is what he says is that your your own sensors senses yeah. are not giving the feedback that in, you are all directly participating. Yes. And the other is that we do have uh, have developed, for example, um, uh, a a. Um, a reason the uh, thing saying oh this is a thing i i can't do that this is a thing i can't i can't shout i can't uh, touch somebody that i don't know i can't you know so so we have those for example inhibitions or we may have what is a being what what is a proper behavior cultural norm right we have those things so they would further put the brake yeah on us you know uh, entertaining the thing even though the raw is input yeah. may be there we would do that so i think it's a combination of those things yes so uh, so i was wondering we have i think everyone here might have experienced that when we watch a movie with someone 
So if there's a like, uh, sensitive part uh, in the movie, you see that uh, some people cry. So I just searched, uh, is it because of the mirror neurons? Actually, uh, there's a hormone that, uh, uh, that is uh, partially responsible for this action and also the mirror neurons. Because we learn to empathize uh, for, uh, act for, for the actions of other people. And then I wanted to link this concept of mirror uh, like uh, imitation with uh, the possible adaptation in the AI. And so first thing I, that came to my mind was, is this reinforcement learning? Then I decided, no, it's not. So someone else might argue, because if you, uh, if you see what's happening in the reinforcement learning, so you have an environment, you have an agent, so now the agent is being told that there are a set of actions he can, uh, it can take, and there are possible uh, state transitions. So here, uh, if, if the, when the agent takes an action which is favorable, we explicitly define a reward function, say, give a positive feedback. It's like training a dog. So if you want to train a dog to grab wool, when it tra grabs it, we say good dog and give a cookie. But if it does not perform the same action, we penalize. So uh, the recent advancements with the AlphaGo actually uh, it was able to play like uh, against a human expert uh, by using this concept. But in the imitation, I'd say it is not just uh, reinforcement learning because we define the reward function there. Uh, there's no imitation. So I found uh, something called imitation learning or reverse, uh, the inverse reinforcement learning. There the goal is uh, the apprentice agent is to learn a control policy or a reward, find a reward function from the expert demonstrations that could explain the expert's behavior. So if you like uh, look at the two versions of AlphaGo and the AlphaGo Zero, now they claim that AlphaGo Zero can uh, have uh, it has found some strategies even the top uh, human expert haven't found yet which means by playing it against self has found uh, some new policies uh, which are not being explicitly uh, defined so is this is adversarial adversarial is actually uh, I think flavor because in the uh, graph image generation, there are two networks, right? One to generate and one to uh, like differentiate. But here, I think uh, in the re reverse, uh, it's an inverse reinforcement learning. Uh, the objective is to like give the agent a chance to uh, like deduce the reward function. So I found two papers. So this uh, Andrew's paper. Uh, algorithms for inverse reinforcement learning, which is actually cited close to thousand times, and it uh, it talks about uh, three uh, algorithms, uh, two method, three mathematical uh, explanations of doing this, uh, finding this reward function, and the 2017 paper bridging the gap between imitation learning and uh, inverse reinforcement learning. It also talks about uh, the mathematical deduction of uh, this finding of like going towards a uh, new agent driven reward function so with uh, in preparing these slides actually uh, i would recommend uh, everyone who is interested in uh, neuroscience to uh, go through these uh, two ted talks by dr ramachandran and this one actually dr shet also shared this uh, susanna Herculiano's. Uh, uh, TED Talk, which is uh, what's so special about human brain. So all these three uh, TED Talks actually, they are related to uh, neuroscience and they talk about why we are so special as opposed to other primates. What, what I'm, what, I, what I'm guessing and imagining um, where we can do so fundamentally different or interesting work is that all this work primarily rely on what the data is. 
or they rely on, there's only two inputs, the data and the training. Right? I mean, there's a training set, there's labels that are given to you. But there's no explanation of why those labels were generated by humans. Right? Whether it's content creator label like in our emotion work or any other thing that uh, actual annotators are doing things. There's no such explanation that is captured, right? If we have this knowledge based approach, then that becomes the basis for, um, you know, uh, explaining, capturing why um, it is labeled that way, why um, that mapping is used, why that transformation takes place. The analogy in our discussion was is roundness and um, you know sharpness. Yeah. If you had those concepts that are already there, it is hard for a computer to automatically count, given a set of data, typically the data is of <coughs> same modal, modal, modality for the computer to come up with the thing that, you know, if I were to try to make corrections based on uh, roundness or sharpness, I would succeed or, or, or that's what most people would do. That kind of stuff comes from outside knowledge kind of thing, top down, from expert, from uh, curated data, that kind of stuff. And that is what we really, uh, that's where the real picking is for us. That's what I've been looking for. Got it? Thank you. All right. I really liked, uh, you know, Ruan's presentation because um, um, he picked, um, uh, you know, a subset that, you know, there's, the book has a lot of things, a lot of issues, but he picked some parts that are relevant that uh, he wanted to comment on. There are three parts, so that is one thing. There is value add. And then uh, he did very important thing. Uh, he tried to uh, hypothesize how uh, you know this thing could be captured in an AI approach, right? And that way we can ask the question: Well, how ready is AI to do these kind of things? Right? We we learn a lot of rather complex things uh, that neuroscience can tell us, right? VS uh, can tell us a lot of you know interesting thing uh, from a neuroscience perspective. And AI is doing something, right? The artificial part of it. And uh, I think anything that you observe that neuroscience has done and say, well, I think this is potentially how I may approximate an AI solution to that, 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 that line of thinking is very important. And so he put it out there. He you know, made that extra attempt to do that. now. It may not be well formed, but uh, it may not have any com concrete result yet. But that's the part of the debate. That's hypothesizing. Then, hopefully, we'll come across some scenario and some data where you can test it out, right? And then, if the, if the test works, well, you have a major new contribution. But this is the kind of presentations that I would uh, really look for. So I hope I hope you guys all observe uh, what was done, right? So, uh, uh, wonderfully exceeded my expectations, man. All right, so where is that? Uh, you guys, uh, you should have kept the thing open. Um, do you have, uh, uh, can you sign in to the um, yes. uh, Google Talk and go to uh, my video and, uh, and, and if you go to just Google group, then we can pull up the paper. And then I can start with putting people on the spot. So, uh, the, Thing that I had um, the homework I had given you was to uh, try and summarize uh, semantic cognitive perceptual computing paper and uh, talk about one point that interested you. And if you fail that, then I will ask you to explain something very specific in the paper or talk. So that's where. Oh, you use another account? Yeah. Oh, okay. Not. <laughs> uh, is there anyone who signed up uh, with the uh, noises account? So I have to factor. Oh, you have to factor <laughs> for uh, Google account? <laughs> yeah. So, you, you want yeah. Yeah. account? Yes. What do you want from that? Go Just sign the, sign in. Go to the community yeah. page. Okay, Thelin, yes. Because I have to leave, uh, when, I, when I listen to your talk, 
we talk about semantic, semantic computing, and then uh, computing, then perceptual computing. Uh, my question is based on this uh, this uh, linearity that one after the other. Is it? I did. There is no linearity. In fact, there is explicit not linearity. Did you go to the? Yes. Uh, did you go to the? Uh, what, what was the question that Raj Reddy asked? Yes, uh, the bracketing of the. Uh, my, but all the time you talks about semantic making the making the sense of the data, the big data integrations, and then cognition where you understand, then perceptual where you try to personalize. All the, uh, my, my question was, uh, what normally happens, isn't it that you have the data which is outside of you, then you perceive it, then you try to understand the cognition comes next. Uh, I just want, uh, my question is, uh, when I read and when I understood, cognition comes at the top, when you perceive the labeling and everything, and then you perceive it towards you, and then you think the cognition. I am not very clear about how, why always the perceptual kind of thing happens at the last. I did not say that. Yes. It doesn't happen necessarily at the last either. In fact, um, uh, uh, you know, if I throw, and you think it's actually, if I, this thing, and if you think actually going to hit you, are you going to have cognition or you're just going to react and move your head? You're going to move your head, right? You, you don't have time to really, uh, you know, um, uh, recognize exactly what is being thrown at you and uh, all these other things. You, you, you're not going to have cognition per se. You're going to simply have perception, uh, you know, and you're going to react. And that will be, in that case, involuntary part of the reaction, right? So, first of all, one is not absolutely necessary for the, I mean, a very loose analogy that I might give <coughs> is that um, um, in our brain, for example, uh, there are different parts of the brain. There's a part that is pretty good at, uh, and this book talks about it. Uh, uh, tell us, uh, there's, a, I think, good bit of discussion, if I remember correctly, on spatial thing, right? Spatial cognition. So you know that while that is being done, you may be uh, your other part is uh, you know really um, uh, getting from the experience uh, what's happening and you know trying to understand let's say object recognition. All these things are happening in parallel and they are communicating with each. That's why if you look at the um, uh, uh, did you look up at the slides? Yes. So, um, in your presentation, it was slide 18. Uh, in, in slide share, you have explained. So the final kind of, you know, uh, so the idea is that you, you can see here at least, and at the end of the day, look, I'm writing on a two-dimensional paper, right? And I have to write in words and I have to, you know, I try and get, first of all, many of the things 
um, like in neuroscience, you do experiments, you know, that mirror experiment, box experiment, or whatever, and see that that's what is, seems to be happening. Um, uh, all of these have to, um, in a way, in this case, is simplified or pedagogy. So one, the semantic computing part is the simplest and much more clear part, right? Because in, in a way, it's just really about labeling the data with regards to knowledge and so we get in taking care of uh, semantic heterogeneity and syntactic heterogeneity and interoperability and those kind of stuff yeah, are, are that is done. And they have a lot more to deal with, and, you know, basically making sense of the data to some abstract level, like what may be a term in a knowledge graph or what may be a term in an ontology. That's basically what it is, right? What what ends up being always is the confusion as to what is the cognitive computing and what is perceptual computing. Right? The the way to and so and I clearly say in the paper this is pedagogy. Pedagogy is to simplify for the method, you know, for the way of discussion and and, and conveying and training. Now um, you know making sense with regards to um, let's say all the facts. So if you look at uh, um, um, the Watson, my, uh, I, IBM Watson, and you look at, for example, the Jeopardy, uh, you know, related work, then you're taking all those facts, uh, including facts from DVPD and such, and trying to make a, a sense of what the question, what the concepts that are involved in the question, that's a cognitive aspect, right? But when you are, you know, trying to uh, go from um, a set of data that you have to say the patient is not doing well, that is not there, you know, and by combining many other things, that is not the way of, which is not simply settled in looking up some knowledge base or direct reasoning as it is, but uh, by combining so many signals, you are saying uh, that um, um, the, the patient is not doing well and needs to be treated. You know, you're going level of abstraction by a lot of other things. That itself may involve use of cognition in the saying that, you know, the patient is um, uh, 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 is not able to get up or breathing too fast and that it, that can be related to this condition translating that into the the higher level abstraction that is where the perception comes in okay. and and if you look at I, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of simpler um, a take on it which I think will always come handy so when you look at uh, if you look at uh, this thing here, yeah. So the idea here is that, oops. If you look at, for example, what's happening in this semantic perception slide. That you're increasingly, you're trying to understand what's there based on, you know, and then you can ask more questions saying, I partially understood that, but if I have more data, I'll understand better. You may understand first this based on the color, uh, or you may understand this based on the shape, <coughs> or you may understand based on the uh, touch or whatever those things. And then you may ask more questions to reach a, uh, a level of understanding that this happens to be a red apple from variety of data. This process is what we call perception cycle, going through this whole thing. So that's, you know, uh, also, uh, Cognitive models of perception. The word cognitive also comes here, by the way. Cognitive model of perception. Right. So, um, in um, another uh, kind of a, um, again, pedagogic, 
pedagogic view, another paper that we have written, uh, we define what we call as horizontal function and vertical function. The horizontal function is clearly the semantic is horizontal in that it allows you to deal with different modality of the data and map it to something common. Perception is more on the is a vertical function that it translates from variety of data signals to something at a high level of abstraction. Cognition doesn't necessarily do that. It can be helping in either of those things. It can it can clearly elevate help, you know, help you understand what's happening at that layer. So, in a again pedagogy that I you know. I use, I would say, yeah, I can help you understand what's happening at that layer by referring to this knowledge, referring to that knowledge. And I can have, I can explain it better, I can give you understanding of this better. And that aspect of that is the cognition aspect. Okay, uh, Joy, what, 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 what is your, um, um, one take of your observation. Yeah, so, uh, so I would like to, uh, what she wanted to know, like in which position cognition comes. So what I understood after reading the paper, like there are these three words mentioned, like semantic, cognitive, and perception. Co semantic, cognition, and perception. So perception, you can see there is a two part, interpretation and exploration. So first is semantics, associating meaning to the data. Then it comes the interpretation. What is the data is saying about you interpret the data? Then comes the cognition. What is understanding the data and understanding the surrounding? Then after doing that, then comes the next part of the uh, perception, that is exploration. Am I right? Yeah. I think that that sounds reasonable way of thinking about yeah. Yeah, yeah that sounds reasonable. And one more thing I liked about like uh, how you link to that, uh, to these two steps, like in uh, interpretation and exploration with uh, how lower brain and upper brain works. Like lower brain does the interpretation and then we, uh, cognition comes and upper brain does the interpretation and takes necessary action. So I think that, you know, the, the, this lower brain and, and bottom-up processing and top-down processing, that those are very important things in that, you know, we, uh, Long ago, I think in the 2005 paper, uh, um, semantics for the semantic web, the implicit, the formal, and the powerful. In that paper, we uh, you know, noticed that um, there's all this bottom-up processing. You give the data and some training or unsupervised no training, you are able to uh, you know, classify, for example. You're going to say, uh, this data represents you put you into this class or that class, this bin or that bin, right? That, that, uh, so, um, uh, but uh, that is only part of the solution. There is also this top-down thing. Like in the brain, we do planning. So, um, well, I mean, I want to go from point A to B and I want to take this kind of route. Where is the bottom of processing here? It could tell you what others want to do, but what I want to do? No, it can't tell you that. <laughs> and so I need to bring my own knowledge, my own experience, my own intentions, my own preferences into the picture. Right? Hence, you know, the, the problem that I want to solve, which path should I take, is not solvable by simply uh, looking at the data of what path everybody else took. Right? Even if um, I had a label that people took went from point A to B using this long scenic path and they liked it even though there's long they liked it if they wanted to have um, you know uh, good views along the way people took this shortest path on the freeway it was not a good you know there's nothing to look around uh, but they liked it because they wanted to you know take a short path and just go from point A to B fa as fast as they can. But where does that bring in what I want to do? So you really have to bring in that additional thing, right? And that is, you know, you, you want to plan on a scenic route, right? So you need to, and, and so thus, where is, you know, what, what does machine learning do for me? 
per se by itself. Okay, so so the computations that will be of interest that that will particularly interest us would be ones that are these ones that will involve human interest, human behavior, human preferences, human likings or dislikes, all those kind of stuff, human cultural affinity, right? And that 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 makes for a, a richer form of presentation. You know, you can't you know the, you can't um, uh, say that all we are doing um, uh, from uh, is you you can't say that all we are doing um, is taking the data and just learning patterns from it. Right? That's the, that's primarily what you are doing today with machine learning. Right? Uh, you are making a lot of distinctions. You are saying when I have this pattern, I like these sensations or I don't like the sensation. Sensation of a good view from the window. Those kind of things may simply not be present in the data, won't be captured in the data. Because we did not employ that sensor, the sensor is still not being built today. That, that we have, what I, I want to like or what I don't like, that I don't have a sensor for that. But that's an important factor, right? So I need to bring that in. Farah. Oh, so you didn't get to it fully, right? Okay, so yes? No, so so what did you did you as for you read this <laughs> thing or uh, heard the presentation? Uh, for this explanation, yes, uh, from the repetitive computing, actually we can get relevant information and uh, improve the. We can improve by getting relevant inf uh, information. We can get we can we can improve the information understanding that it help us for the decision making. Decision making. This is what you ask for this slide, right? No, give me a, one clear, that, that's too vague. Give me one clear takeaway from the talk. Manas. So, Dr. Shirt has uh, from the uh, paper on semantic perceptual computing. What I, what I read, I, uh, I read from a perspective of a chatbot. Like the conversational AI, which is proliferating, like which is basically the future of right now. What the future technologies are talking about? About how chatbot is not the uh, basically the uh, chatbot is not able to model perception, cognition, and semantics together in the current state, mm -hmm. and how it can be used. So. The basic thing is like when you want to build a chatbot, you need the first uh, the chatbot should, should be able to get what is the intention behind the user being asking us some question, or what is the intention a user uh, what is the basically intention behind the query a person is putting for uh, in front of the chatbot. So that is what the perception is. What I was able to model. Then the comes about uh, comes about the how how you can model it into a semantic uh, framework is what information the chatbot has in its innate database or in its innate storage that it can model the uh, question or the basically the query uh, to develop the semantic understanding and for the cognition what I was able to say that how it can understand the context in which the query has been uh, fired in front of him what is the context in which the person is ask, asking the question so that three things together will uh, will help in developing a conversational AI interface, which I was thinking like the current chatbot is not, and that is like you don't have any existing framework that involves all the three components together. So I just wrote something, I can share it with you as well, uh, where I talk about like how you can have that uh, chatbot can be seen as a confluence of. Uh, three components together with the machine learning framework. Okay, uh, I... Plausible but still very weak right now, you know, you're kind of doing a lot of hand-waving from the words that you use so far, but okay. 
So, um, um, Joey, can you explain what I'm saying on this slide? Uh, abstraction, is it? No. Not at all. Uh, if you if, did, you listen to the video. Yeah, yeah. So I said, what did I say here? Representation, data representation, data structures, and all this. Okay. Anybody else? Contextualized perception. I think here you talk about the big data. Um, big data um, issues limited to enterprise and all this. Because here, what the data increase? Number of the data increase. Actually, everything else in the slide, even then, you're not able to explain. Directly or uh, through some representation in some situations. Taking decisions, doing actuations. You mentioned that uh, in olden days they they has uh, less number of resources uh, to represent uh, data, and here uh, uh, you represent that. Uh, geographical data with, by using less memory and by using that we interpret. Yeah, I think you are the closest so far. So the point here is that for many years, uh, and uh, um, um, anyone, you know, but, uh, the, you have something happening in the real world, like a traffic. Right? And um, the amount of information or data that we had about that particular real world phenomena that we are studying was always very limited. There are multiple reasons for that. First of example, one reason is that, well, computers had 16 gigabyte of memory, or even less when I started, you know, you, when I started the memory, the computer had in megabytes. When the, um, uh, you know, uh, kilobytes, rather, sorry. Uh, so we started with kilobytes. Uh, I, um, uh, one of my first project wa was at ISRO, Indian Space Station Organization, where uh, I had Motorola uh, 6800 or 68000, and I added a uh, chip to extend the memory for that uh, microprocessor by 8K. 8K. Right? That was a big deal. Double the or whatever. So, um, what then what happened was that you want to solve some problem, you can only represent so much information about that problem. So you have to simplify it. That means you create a model of the world, traffic world in this case, tra um, and, and make that model very simple. Because that's all you can represent, store, and compute. In our days, in early days, when we used to learn, our, um, one of the main thing about uh, algorithm course in our case was uh, time and space trade-off. You give me more memory, I can compute it faster. You guys probably don't even, you know, study that now. It's still, it's still there? Okay. But it is more or less, um, uh, if you study that, that means you're just doing it for theoretical reason. There is no practical, you know, you know, most of the time you're not applying that very explicitly. In our case, we have to explicitly uh, muck around with the data base and data structure and uh, everything, saying I only have that much space and we would know exactly what, uh, how much memory of my computer is being used. You don't ask that question. You simply say, I don't have enough memory. Um, uh, so, so, or you simply move from your uh, laptop to server and to cloud. So that is one thing. The other thing is that for anything that's happening, I. Thank you. Have a good night. Um, and uh, the second thing is that uh, we have a lot more data. We have many sensors. So for road, every link on the road, there is a sensor that tells you the, uh, you know, how many vehicles are passing through that thing every uh, minute, or you know, every vehicle that pass is noticed by the sensor. And you know, you, you can from there get averages and so on. And and you can look at from the satellite. And there is a video camera looking at the road. And then there is a traffic report 
immediately being uploaded uh, if there was any traffic uh, report that a uh, human generated. And that is accessible. So the amount of data that we have to represent, the depth and the, the fidelity. So the, we are, this we have to make very artificial, limited representation of the data. Now we are able to represent data at a much finer granularity, at a near real world uh, thing. Every data, we, we would like to, now we strive to gather every data available for a situation and process it. We don't say, oh, we can't process this data, so throw away. No, we say, what data can we get? What can we get? As much as we can get. Let's keep on adding so that I have more information, right? We may, we, in here you get a tweet data where human says that there is a um, um, traffic uh, jam and he has tweeted that, we'll know that, that human has said that. We'll get data from the web where there's a planned road uh, resurfacing going on, we would know that. Maybe it is, oh, today road surface is planned, that's why it's slow. There are so many other data, many modality of data. And so we are able to process in computer, you know, our computational processing of data is at the near real scale. Here, your data, you, you made a lot of compromises because your computing power was very low, your ability to collect data was very limited. And hence, you made very synthetic and limited processing, computation on the limited data and limited uh, uh, you know, computational power. And then you have to do a lot of extrapolation, the big extrapolation, because only something was possibly, you know, computer can only help you so much. Here now, the computer can help you in a lot more ways because we have a lot more memory, we have a lot more type of data, we have ability to deal with multiple modality, like through semantics and other things. We have more powerful models, like, you know, uh, more complex graph processing that we could do than before. We, we can go from, um, you know, um, a simple database uh, tables to graph models to uh, label graph models to probabilistic graph models. Not only we have labels on the edges, but we also have probabilities. So we have high, far, far much more finer grain models also. More data, deeper representation, uh, less, you know, models that mimic the real world in, uh, you know, more with higher fidelity, refinement, and hence what we come out with is much easier to interpret. Okay. I said all of this in my class, in my uh, talk. So why is it uh, so hard? Joy, I said all of this in my talk. Yeah, but I pay more attention on the on the core concept, core idea of your presentation. <laughs> this is a core idea, actually. One of the core ideas, right? Don't you think so? It's not core idea. It oh. is not. It, this does not. De if you think carefully, it adds. Uh, from here on, I can extrapolate the demand on semantic processing. I can extrapolate the demand on community uh, computing. So it is also that, even though while explaining this slide, I did not use the word uh, in my talk, semantic cognitive perception. Things are related in multitude of ways, right? Okay, I think the time is, uh, you know, well beyond our uh, uh, plan, so we'll artificially end the there's a lot to more, lot more to discuss with artificial intelligence. Uh, end here. Uh, we'll, I think, again, uh, start with um, a um, uh, you know book presentation, and I will. Uh, uh, if there is time left, then I'll continue uh, to ask you questions about this. Okay. Uh, so, so, so that um, uh, now, uh, what I also suggest is that. Um, if you, uh, if uh, you know, here, there is another. If you go to about the community, right? 
there's there are two papers so this is the main paper but there's also this one here so what I would suggest is that anybody who in this group works with IOT in K Health project should look at that and also come ready to discuss that. Right. If not first one. The first one is the main one that you should be reading anyway. Right? That's the that's the the first one is the main paper. Um I would I'll be asking you about this thing. And uh, let me add to you, uh, you are reading one more thing. Uh, this is a parallel reading, so. Please read uh, this one, Computing for Human Experience. And there are also videos for this. If you go to my homepage and you know the, the spe talks and speeches, you'll see the link for videos. There will be a video for this talk also. And uh, my, uh, uh, you know, corollary is that I'll ask you to make connection between the two things. Okay. 